The actual length of the ministry of John the Baptist is unknown, but Luke records that his ministry began in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. We might speculate that the total duration of John's ministry was less than two years. Even in this short time frame, John shook the established religious status quo and broke up the hard fallowed ground that surrounded the hearts and minds of the multitudes. No doubt, John prepared the spiritual hearts of the people for the new seed coming from Jesus. John prepared the way for the Messiah. The ministry of John came in fulfillment of key Old Testament prophecies that would usher in the Messianic age. John's coming fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that he would prepare the way for the Lord and make straight in the desert a highway for our God. He also would fulfill the prophecy given by Malachi that he would be the messenger, the forerunner of the Messiah, who would suddenly come to his temple. Jesus also noted that John came in the spirit and power of Elijah, prophesied by Malachi, to turn the hearts of the children of Israel back to Jehovah. John's ministry was not the main event, he was only the warm-up band. It's important to remember that John and Jesus were cousins who probably spent some portion of their formative years in contact with each other during the annual feasts at Jerusalem. At what point John went to the desert to join an Essene community is unknown, but Jesus was not a perfect stranger to John. The time came for Jesus to enter his prophetic office. He did not proceed to Jerusalem and herald the arrival of the Messianic Age, but instead he goes to the Jordan River to fulfill another divine appointment with his cousin John. Jesus came to be baptized by John as an act of acknowledgement and submission to the forerunner, the prophetic Elijah. John came to prepare the way for the Lord, and that way led through the Jordan River. The question of Jesus' baptism has concerned Christians for a long time. Why would Jesus Christ, the sinless one, come and submit to an act of water baptism that was identified with repentance and pagan converts? Let's examine this event in the life of Christ. One thing needs to be made clear Jesus was not baptized into the office of priest. He was not coming after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. The resurrection completed that process that inducted Jesus into the office of high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Then why did Jesus submit to the ceremony of baptism? The New Testament indirectly provides four reasons for why this event occurred. Jesus was baptized by John in order to fulfill all righteousness. Righteousness in reference to what or whom? There is no mandate given in the Old Testament for a ceremonial baptism in acknowledgement of repentance. Rabbinic doctrine relegated water baptism to non-Jewish converts. Then what righteousness did this event fulfill? In Leviticus chapter 16 verse 4, a priest was consecrated into his office with a ceremonial washing of water. The law demanded that one entering into an office should go through ritual cleansing. Jesus was not baptized into the office of priest, but into the office of Messiah. Jesus' response could also allude to the Essene indoctrination experienced by John in the desert. According to the Manual of Discipline scroll, found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Essenes engaged in daily ritual cleansings and were required to submit to ceremonial baptism upon their admittance to the community. Jesus using the phrase, to fulfill all righteousness, has clear Essene influence because it was a common phrase used in Essene communities. 
The second reason Jesus submitted to the baptism of John was to confirm to him that he was the Messiah. John understood that, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. The baptism of Jesus was to release John to make a public announcement concerning the coming of Christ. The third reason Jesus was baptized was to identify himself with the believing remnant in Israel who was bound together by John's baptism. The fourth reason is not uniquely Jewish in nature, but it has Christian overtones. Even though John's baptism was a Jewish ritual, it did not fit into the Jewish dogma of the day. His baptism was a clear call for the repentance of sin and a return to the true spirit of the law of Moses. John insisted that everyone, Jew or Greek, must accept baptism on the same terms. John's baptism was not in accordance with the rabbinic thinking that pervaded Jewish dogma. A ceremonial washing that identifies all people as sinners is not a Jewish concept, but it echoes the New Testament being ushered in by the Messiah. Jesus accepted baptism in order to identify himself with sinners. Being baptized by John marked Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus would be the one who would take the sins of the world upon himself. Jesus went into the waters of baptism not to wash away his personal sin, but to take upon himself the sin of the world. John's declaration that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is a direct reference to Isaiah that the Messiah would be a lamb being led to the slaughter, the eternal Paschal Lamb that would be offered in atonement for sin. John wanted all of his hearers to understand that Jesus was the true Lamb being offered by God, not a lamb raised and furnished by men. According to apocryphal rabbinic writings from this time period, the Messiah shall bear the sins of the Israelites. John took this thought one step further. He understood that the true Lamb of God would take away the sins of the entire world, Jew and Gentile alike, not just Israel. What a revolutionary concept! As soon as Jesus rose out of the waters of baptism, John saw heaven open and the Holy Spirit descending like a dove and landing on Jesus. John then heard a mighty voice, a voice that could only come from heaven. This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jehovah acknowledging his love and acceptance of Jesus as his Son is an intimate touching moment between father and son that John was allowed to experience. This declaration by Jehovah concerning Jesus might have greater legal significance than intimate family bonding. What we witnessed in the gospel narrative may have been a legal adoption of Jesus as God's heir to the kingdom of God. According to Hebrew and Roman custom, adoption is a position of authority not a relationship to a family. In these cultures, a male child was not guaranteed a legal inheritance based solely on birthright. It was required that a child prove his worth before he could take position of authority in the family. Adoption was a legal procedure that determined legal position. Should a son prove to his father his moral worth and responsibility, a celebration ceremony was conducted where the father would declare his son heir of his estate. Usually the father would give his son a signet ring that allowed him to perform business in the name of the father. This adoption procedure was not automatic. Should a son show himself unworthy to inherit the estate, then the son could be passed over in lieu of a more acceptable candidate. There's recorded instances in history where family friends 
or even worthy slaves were given the legal status of adoption instead of sons. Once an adoption tie was created, it could only be broken through a ceremony of emancipation. It was required that the ceremony of adoption took place in the presence of seven witnesses. The adoption ceremony included a legal formula that required the adoptee to touch the ceremonial wand while the adopter said, I claim this man as my son. It was the function of the witnesses to testify that the transaction was in truth the adoption of the child. We can see that the phrase, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased, is in fact the formula used by the adoption process. God sealed the ceremony by giving Jesus the Holy Spirit. Notice that the Holy Spirit came to Jesus in the form of a dove, not in the form of burning fire. Why did the Holy Spirit come this way? Since Jesus did not have sin in his life, the burning fire of the Holy Spirit was not needed. John came baptizing with water, but Jesus came with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. Rabbinic writings from this time period indicated that the common consensus among Jewish thought was that the Holy Spirit was not available to them as it was to the prophets. The life of God and the Holy Spirit was lost in the quagmire of theological debate and legalism. The concept of John the Baptist coming in the spirit and power of Elijah was contentious and nerve-wracking to the chief priests and the scribes, but it inspired the common folk. To speak the word of God with power and authority challenged the established rabbinic tradition. A new age was needed, an age that would usher in a new revelation of God. Into this seething cauldron of lifeless religious opinion, the Holy Spirit came as a fresh wind. The Holy Spirit descending on Jesus in the form of a dove indicates the inauguration of the Messianic age, with Jesus being the Spirit Bearer. All three synoptic gospels record that Jesus was compelled by the Holy Spirit to journey into the desert. At first glance, we might think that God made a mistake and sent Jesus in the wrong direction. The Messiah, fresh and new with the Holy Spirit, should go to Jerusalem to proclaim the word of the Lord to the stodgy Sanhedrin. But this did not happen. Why did the Holy Spirit compel Jesus to go into the desert? The same synoptic gospels immediately answered this question. Jesus, fresh and new with the Holy Spirit, must prove that he can submit to the leadings of this gentle dove. During his baptism, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit for the messianic ministry entrusted to him. Jesus was led into the wilderness to prove his moral right to be God's eternal king priest. Tradition locates the temptation of Jesus at Mount Quaratina, a mountain that rises out of the Judean plains 1,200 feet above the Jordan Valley, approximately seven miles northwest of the town of Jericho. The Apostle Paul understood that the first man created was Adam, and he was made a living soul, while Jesus came as a quickening spirit, the last and final Adam. Should this be the case, then Jesus' right to rule must be tested in a fashion similar to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Adam had free will and the right to choose his direction. Even so, Jesus also possessed free will and the right of choice. Would Jesus fail in his test like Adam? The devil had legal right to answer this question. For 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus was tempted by the devil to exert his personal will over the will of the Holy Spirit. For 40 years, the children of Israel were tested in the wilderness to reveal the heart of the nation. God wanted to know what was in their hearts. Would they humble themselves in the sight of the Lord? 
Would the nation of Israel strive to keep the commandments of the Lord? Would the nation learn to fear their God and keep from sinning? God would have an answer. The book of Deuteronomy records three commandments given by God to test the children of Israel. And these three commandments are the root of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Before we delve into the test presented to Jesus, let's consider what the Apostle John wrote in his first epistle. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. John understood that the root cause for sin is the love of the world and the things in the world. He understood that sin can enter through three different portals into the human soul, and these gates form the path of sin into our human nature. Adam stumbled as a result of sin that entered through one of these portals, while the nation of Israel also corrupted because they yielded to the path of sin. Would the same thing happen to Jesus? Would he follow the path of sin? The devil seeks to challenge and define Jesus' sonship, his adopted authority against God's word spoken from heaven at the baptism of Jesus. The devil uses the three challenges recorded in Deuteronomy to test the Son of Man. A battle of spiritual wit and authority began with the dueling arena being the truth of God's written word. The first test to confront Jesus was an appeal to the basic of all human needs, food and water. Matthew chapter 4, verse 2 through 4. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Hear the words of Satan. If you really are the Son of God, in possession of his Holy Spirit, then prove it. Command these stones to be made into bread. Satan, the tempter, sought to sift Jesus' understanding of his sonship. Jesus parried Satan's first thrust with a quotation from Deuteronomy 8.3. He humbled you, caused you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. It's important to understand that Jesus was in the desert in accordance to the will of his Father. All that Jesus experienced in the desert, including hunger, was part of the design and plan of God. Jesus was confronted with the most basic of human needs, and that need is physical hunger. Jesus was enticed by Satan with food and the desire to place his physical needs and comforts before the will of God. Satan's temptation was an attempt to manipulate Jesus into imposing his self-will over his submission to the will of God. The second test was more direct to the point. Satan tested the depth of Jesus' pride and self-will. Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 through 7. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Satan challenged Jesus' sonship by attempting to manipulate him into testing God and his faith in his mission. Satan used a distortion of Psalms 91, verse 11 and 12 as a means to create his test. 
for he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Again, hear the words of Satan. If you really are the Son of God, in possession of his Holy Spirit, then prove it to me. Put your ministry to the test. Is God really with you? Jesus again parried Satan's second thrust with a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Satan challenged Jesus to defend himself by proving who he was in reference to his mission. Satan's tactic was to get Jesus to exalt himself and put his father to the test. Jesus denied himself and refused to exalt his own position. Therefore he remained humble before God his Father. The final test of Satan that confronted Jesus was the most cruel and wicked of them all. Matthew chapter 4 verse 8 through 10 Again the devil took him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Satan paraded, the kingdoms of the world before Jesus Christ, and offered to them as an inheritance, should Jesus only worship him. Satan understood that Jesus would set upon a throne and rule the entire world as an inheritance, because this was recorded in Psalm chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, and this day I have begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. What did Satan offer Jesus? He offered Christ an imitation throne without the suffering of the cross. Satan offered Jesus an easy way to his inheritance. Satan tempted Jesus with a throne that did not include the cross. Satan tempted Jesus with taking the easy path, a shortcut, to his inheritance, not the path of the cross. Again, hear the words of Satan. Okay, so you are the Son of God. Then let me give you the inheritance promised by God to the Messiah without obedience to God's revealed will. The path before you includes pain and suffering that you do not need to endure. I will give you your inheritance without the cross. Jesus again parried Satan's third thrust with the quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massa. There was nothing else Satan could say or do. Jesus proved his moral right to his messianic mantle by his refusal to test his relationship with God. The Bible only records that the devil left Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, verse 11. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. At the baptism of Jesus, God the Father declared that Jesus was his son, in whom he was well pleased. The temptation in the wilderness demonstrated the perfection of the sonship ministry in Jesus and thus authenticated his father's approval. Luke made an interesting observation. When Jesus was led into the desert, Luke said that Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost. But when Jesus returned from his 40-day ordeal, he returned in the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 and verse 14, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit 
into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. Something happened. Jesus changed. Jesus entered the desert full of the Holy Spirit, but he came out of the desert flowing in the power of the Holy Spirit. The devil sifted the messianic authority of Jesus and found it authentic. During these 40 days, Jesus learned to yield his self-will to the direction and authority of his messianic anointing. The denial of self became the key that released the Holy Spirit in power and authority. Who is this Jesus Christ? He was a man who understood hunger and thirst. He wrestled with pride as we do. He was the Son of God who submitted himself to the will of God. He understood that the path before him included the pain, suffering, and death of the cross. But this eventual end did not dissuade Jesus from obedience to the narrow path set before him. Jesus knew fear, but his fear did not overshadow his faith. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When we view the trials that confronted Jesus in the wilderness, it would be easy just to shrug our shoulders and admit that we are not Jesus. Whether we like it or not, each and every day we are confronted with the same basic tests. The path of sin mentioned by the Apostle John was no different for Jesus as it is for us. He was tempted in every way that we might experience, but he did not sin. We might feel the shame of our sin, but let's never lose our faith in the eternal quality of Christ's redemption. Grace is given to us as the free gift of God, available to all who draw near the throne of grace. For at this place, we will find mercy and help in our time of need. Consider these thoughts. Are you caught in the trap of Satan? to place your own physical needs and comforts before the will of God? Does Satan constantly challenge you to defend yourself to other people and prove your Christianity? The next time you hear somebody say, if you really are a Christian, you would do this or that, let the example presented by Jesus encourage you to trust in God alone for your redemption, not the opinions of men. You stand or fall by what God thinks of you, not other men or women. Are you caught by the trap of Satan to compromise with the world in order to escape the rigors of the true Christian experience? Do you look for the easy path to follow when confronted with the will of God? Determine now where your faith and obedience lie. Let the words of Joshua ring in your ears. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord.